May I welcome you to the most exciting studies maybe we've had. This is a very special series of studies. What was God doing? Anything? When world religions were born, when, when non-Christian religions were born, what was God doing at that time? Do we know? Can we find out for sure? We're going to look into the story of mankind and discover what God was doing. In this series, we're going to be telling you about animism, about Egyptian religion, Babylonian religion, uh, Hinduism, and uh, Shintoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and uh, most of the great large religions of the world to show you that these religions actually knew the true God and did not follow the true God. In these special studies, uh, we wish to also show you that the critics of Christianity very often uh, charge uh, such persons as myself of being bigoted uh, if, they, if they wish to change the lives of pagans and, uh, and, and, and the heathen. They declare that the pagans have, have believed as they do from earliest history, maybe before man, and should be left alone morally and religiously. Now this is a fallacious attitude and it reveals limited research and historic misconception when it comes to the story of mankind or even the story of religion. These same critics of Christianity that say that we should leave those people alone I do not have the same attitude regarding ignorance in education, ignorance in science, ignorance in industry, and things of this nature. Uh, they are willing to assist the underprivileged people of the world in material ways, yet in their eternal matters, in their destiny in heaven, uh, they, they say, leave them alone. Now, what I wish to inform you is that the deep-rooted cause of most problems and uh, of, of most... Uh, economic problems and moral problems, they have to do with religion and that the religions bring these things upon them. For example, in India, uh, how could you resolve the economic problems of India with the same religion it has now? You could not do it. Nobody could do it. It could never be done. You say, why? Well, they believe that a louse or a rat it could be one of their uh, four parents. So they won't kill them. So they're going to have disease and they're going to have a rodent eating up their food from them. And as long as a cow is a god standing around on the streets and on the sidewalks, and believing that the cow is a god and worshiping the cow, and I have personally been to the funeral of a cow in, in New Delhi, India, how are you going to bring them food, meat, and, and, uh, and bread to their lips and to make them, make them healthy until you have a change of religion. Now, neighbors, in every problem that you find among these countries, you're going to find that generic, when you hit the basis of it, you're going to find it has to do with the relationship with God. You cannot leave those people alone. Now, God tells us this in Ezekiel 3, 18, when he says, I say unto the wicked, that's all the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and you better believe it. And thou givest him not warning, speaking to thee, man that knows God, nor speak it to him to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. Now God requires you and God requires me that we speak to all the people on the face of this earth regarding their eternal destiny, and that is their salvation. So every Christian should be a missionary. Every Christian should warn others about about judgment to come if they do not love God. In our first lesson, which I hope that you uh, were able to see, uh, we began in the beginning and, and uh, we, we took the, the great time of, that God uh, created. We went into the state of innocence. We went into conscience. We went into human government. And we went into promise. And right there we stopped in, in the area of promise. And so we're going to go back to that state and uh, from the big, beautiful chart. Also, we will be taking you to our, our big globe here because it's very essential for you to know where these religions came from. Uh, the Christian religion came from this area here in the area called Palestine. You know, it is Jerusalem. Mohammedism came from the Arabian Peninsula uh, where they have the Muslim faith under Muhammad. And the, the uh, Hindu religion uh, came from India, and also the Buddha religion came from India. So we have two 
uh, vast religions coming from this area, and then you have the Confucian religion coming from this area, and the Tao religion, that's T-A-O, the Tao religion coming from here, and then you have the Shinto coming here out of Japan. So beginning at the Pacific Ocean and going across to the Mediterranean Sea, you have the great religions of the world, and, and that is their, their bed place. <laughs> uh, that is where they came from. In our second part of the lesson that we're giving to you, when God was doing what? Uh, we brought you from the beginning of time to Abraham. Up until this point, there had been very little, very little uh, 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 paganism or idol worship. There had just been rebellion against God and sin. Now, at the birth of Abraham, reading in Genesis chapter 11, if you wish to follow me, uh, from verse 9 through verse 26, there were 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. Just 10 generations. Now, that's all. Just 10, Papa and Grandpapa and great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather. There were only 10 generations. Now, that's not much. You can carry by word of mouth, you see, uh, th through my grandfather, who took me back two generations, to my grandchildren that can go back, go on further two generations. You got two, you got three, you got three, four. You almost have 10 generations that I can stand in the middle of here, you see, for my great-grandparents that I knew very well and lived with for a number of years to me and to my grandchildren, and they're reaching out two generations to their grandchildren, you, you've got a span here of something like what we're talking about right now. Now, reading with me, there, these are the generations of Shem. Now, Shem was in the ark, and he knew God. He heard the voice of God. He stood at the altar when God made the great promise of the rainbow that he would never destroy the earth, that would always be a spring, there would always be seed time and harvest. Now, now Shem, the, the Bible says, was 100 years old, and, and he begot Arphaxed. So there's your second generation, Arphaxed. Uh, two years after the flood, Shem lived after he begot Arphaxed 500 years, begot sons and daughters. Arphaxed lived five and 30 years and begot Selah. Now you've got the third generation. So you've gone from Shem to Arphaxed to Selah. And Arphaxed lived after he begot Selah 400, 400 and three years, and he begot sons and daughters, and Selah lived lived 30 years and begot Eber. And that we have come to Eber. Now that is beginning with Noah. And when you get to Eber, uh, you, you are, are getting to the point in history here in this fourth generation where, where God uh, divided the earth up, you see, where God made all the continents. If you get a map, you can see that the world all fits together. Look at this map over here. You see how Africa hugs right under there and closes in there by India? And you can see here how, uh, how Vietnam and Malaya and all sweeps right in there by, by India and closes up the gap. And, and so it is on the other side. You can see, well, the scientists used to call it Gondwana land. It was the earth in one piece, uh, which it no longer is. And, and so Eber begot Selah, and he begot uh, Eber 403 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Now you got your fourth generation. Eber lived 430 years and begot Peleg. Now, it was in Peleg's time when the earth was divided. And he begot sons and daughters. And Peleg uh, lived 30 years and begot Ru. Now you've got the, the sixth generation. And Peleg uh, lived after he begot Ru 209 years and he begot sons and daughters. And then, and then he begot Serug, S-E-R-U-G. Now he is the seventh generation. Now Ru lived after he begot Serug 207 years and begot sons and daughters. And, and Serug lived 30 years and begot Nahor. Now, when you get to Nahor, uh, you're getting to the grandfather of Abraham already. And that is in your eighth generation from Noah. So you see, Noah and Abraham were not far apart. And, and, the, and all the pagan religions had to come into being during that time, uh, the major ones. And so he lived 30 years and begot Nahor. And Serug lived after he begot Nahor 200 years and begot sons and daughters. And Nahor lived nine and 20 years and begot Terah. Now, that was, that was his father. You see, that was his father. And Nahor lived after he begot Terah, 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Terah lived 70 years and begot Abraham. So there you come to the 10th generation. At this point in time, we find the earth in a remarkable condition. Now we have brought you from Noah right up to Abraham. In these 10 generations, man began worshiping idols during those 10 generations. They for had forgotten the divine truths that were handed to them by Noah. And, and they began, they're, they're, they're wandering and they're going away from God in a very strong way. But during this time, look what God had done. 
God established in Jerusalem a king and a priest named Melchizedek. You find that in Genesis 14. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's Jerusalem, they call it Jerusalem, and brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And Abraham paid him tithes of all he had. So we had this tremendous priest who was a priest and a king living in Jerusalem, ruling there before Abraham was even called out of Ur of the Chaldees. Now, this is substantiated in the New Testament in Hebrews 5 and 6. It says, As he has spoken also in another place, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And, and uh, in Hebrews uh, 6 and 20, whether the forerunner is for us, entered, and even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Then in Hebrews 7 and 1, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And so God had a witness of the earth. We find him in the form of Melchizedek. But at that same time, at that same time, in these areas, right through here especially, in these areas through here, they were making their own gods, you see. Now, I've gone through those areas, and I have brought back <laughs> gods, you see. Uh, as you can see, this came up out of a field. It was dug up in, in a field. Uh, see the, the, the God here uh, that was brought up uh, from a field as it was dug? And, uh, and they, they began to make for themselves uh, their own gods. And, and so uh, uh, this is what they began to, to create and, and to make uh, as, for them, as for them to worship. And when they began to make their own gods, they normally left a hole in the back of them for the spirit of the God to come into. And so they created uh, these gods that they might, they might worship them. And uh, not only did they worship uh, creatures that they, uh, that they fabricated, and they worship animals and they worship serpents. Now this is a serpent's tail and I got it from a place of worship. And they used to put a special incense in here and, and, and set it on fire, put the little cap on it like that, and then they would burn the incense and blow the smoke toward the person, and then they would receive their miracle. And so here we have uh, them operating their, their pagan religions. Now this began in the time that we have called in the Abrahamic period, or on our map here, it is, is called that time of promise, a promise. It was in this time period that Hinduism began in India. They now have 300 million gods. In one of our lessons, we will be giving substantial uh, material regarding this. At this period of time, the, the, the pyramids were built in Egypt. At this period of time, uh, at the king's courts, there appeared magicians. Magicians appeared at this time at king's courts in order to direct their decisions. And, and, uh, and so they began to depend on the devil when God wouldn't talk to them, they, depend, they began to depend on the devil. Now, it was during this period of time that a man like Joseph came to this, the scene. And uh, we advanced just three generations from Abraham to 1,700 years before Christ. And we find now that Egypt is filled with mysterious witchcraft. And at the same time, Joseph had an understanding of spiritual visions and knew the living God the pharaohs of Egypt, who were the kings of Egypt. In Genesis 41, 8 says, It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. That's the king. He sent and called for his magicians of Egypt and all of his wise men, fortune tellers. And they came to Pharaoh and he told them the dream, but there was, not, there was none that could interpret the dream for Pharaoh. So Joseph, in Genesis 41 and 6, Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me, now, see, here was God trying to direct the whole. We're going to give you more of this. We're going to have a whole lesson on Egypt and Egypt's religions. Uh, it says, God will give Pharaoh an answer. That man cannot do it, but God will do it. Now, this is the living God. Then in Genesis 41, 32, and for the dream that was doubled under Pharaoh twice, it became the thing that established by God and that God was known in that whole kingdom as answering the problem, giving them Joseph as their leader, seven years of blessing and seven years of, uh, of sorrow and, and seven years of drought. 
Now, the witness came to Pharaoh in, in verse 41 and verse 38, chapter 41, verse 38. And, and Genesis said, Pharaoh said in his servants, can we find such a one as this? Is a man in whom the spirit of God is. Pharaoh made a different be difference between his idols, but between his superstitions, between his wise men and the spirit of the living God. This shows you that man had a knowledge of God. They did not want to take the trouble to find him. Every pagan religion in history is in direct rebellion to the true and living God. And they still are. They still are. They still are. Every non-Christian religion, the Christian religion, uh, along with the Judaic religion, is, is, uh, is centered in Jehovah God and the great creator of the universe. The non-Christian the non religions of the world are centered in mysticisms. They're centered in lies. They're, they're, they're centered in, in, in traditions they've handed down from generation uh, to generation. In 1451 before Christ, which is not very long, uh, 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 you know, when you get to millennium and a half, we see a whole world witness of divine intervention. In Genesis 41, 53, the seven years of plenty of years uh, that, that were on the land of Egypt ended, the seven years of dearth was in the land, and the, all, the, all of the land of Egypt had bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph. Uh, what he saith that you do? And the famine was over the face of the earth. That's in Genesis 41, 53, and 57. God had a witness at that point in history. The Bible says to the whole earth, and you must believe the Bible. Joseph opened all the storehouses in Egypt, and he sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt, and all countries, you either believe it or you don't believe it. It's in Genesis 41. All countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy corn, because of the famine were sore in all lands. Here was a, the, the witness of God, just like Noah. You see? The witness of God to a whole earth for the world to come and to see that God had a witness in the earth to give to them. Therefore, I say that non-Christian religions or pagan religions and heathen religions, that they are volitional. That they come of their own intent, of their own will and their own desire. And, and that they come in spite of a rebellion. Up in Tibet, I asked a man uh, that had never heard the name Jesus, never heard the word Christian. I was just talking along with him through my interpreter, and I, I said, could I ask you a personal question? He said, yes, through my interpreter. I put my arm on his shoulder, and I said, if you found your neighbor in the bed with your wife, what would you do? He said, I'd kill him. I said, why? He says, it's wrong. I said, how do you know it's wrong? He says, I'm told so in here. I said, that's very interesting. I said, if you had a good friend and you had a piece of gold in your house and while you were out working, he, he took your gold, what would you do? He said, I'd kill him. I said, what would you kill him for? He says, for taking my gold. Well, I said, what's wrong with that? He says, it's wrong to steal. Did you know? <laughs> I tested almost all of the Ten Commandments and here was a man that had never heard of Jesus. He had never heard the word Christ. He had never heard the word church and he knew right from wrong. If I'd have asked him if he had stolen, he'd say yes. I'd say, have you ever committed adultery? He'd say yes. Then I'd say, but why did you do it when you would kill another man for doing it? He'd have to say, I don't know. Like a Buddhist in India told a friend of mine. He said, you know, I've studied both Christianity and Buddhism. And he says, I see one great dis difference. In our religion, we're told what to do and can't do it. But in your religion, you can do it. You better believe it. That is the difference between Christianity and the rest of the world. What I wish to show you in these first two lessons is that at every juncture of history, that God was there. God was not asleep. God was not on a long journey. That God placed men. Abraham went into Egypt at the right time to establish the God religion. He already had visited Melchizedek. He knew Melchizedek was in Jerusalem. He knew he was a priest of the Most High God. He visited Egypt and said, don't go serve idols. Serve the true and the living God. You see, he was ready to do it. And then, and then God sent Joseph down. And, and uh, that was three generations later. And Joseph led the country. And from the Bible, the king fed the whole earth corn. They came there and received their food. And 
They heard the story. We have food because of Joseph. Joseph knows the true and the living God. Through a vision, God told him what to do. And so they had a readjustment in their lives to who was God and what God could do for, for people. Pharaoh said in Exodus 5 and 2, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? This same Pharaoh had the records of Joseph because it was only 400 years before. He knew that Joseph had saved their nation. He knew that it all came by divine revelation. But he would rather have uh, his serpents to worship, his golden calf to worship, his insects, and especially the beetle uh, to worship, and, and so he said, I would rather worship the sun. I'd rather worship the moon. I'd rather worship the stars. I'd rather make images for me to worship. And so I'd rather have my own deities that I could control rather than worshiping this true and the living God. Then Pharaoh called the wise men. The problem in all of history with pagan religions has to do with demon power and these people that call themselves wise men. In Exodus 7 11, Pharaoh called these wise men the sorcerers, now the magicians of, e of Egypt. And they said, in like manner were the enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he, hardened, and, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And so here we have a contest between God and these magicians. And they went so far, and they went so far, and they couldn't go any further. They couldn't go any further. And so the Lord delivered these children of Israel, some 1,600 years before the Lord Jesus came, God delivered these children of Israel and he took them out into the desert. And when he took them out there, what was the first thing he said to them when he made them a nation? What was the first thing that God said to them? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you just like to know what God said? Open your Bible with me and you'll see just exactly what God said. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, We'll begin at verse 1 in chapter 20. God spoke these words. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Isn't that something? The first thing he said, you call it one of the Ten Commandments. Look what he said in the second one. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or in earth beneath or in the waters that are under the earth. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them to serve them. I am the Lord thy God, and I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. That's what God thinks about it. The iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and the fourth generation of them. Are you reading your Bible? He says that hate me. That hate me. Now that's the position that God puts it in uh, when, when, when people refuse, when people refuse to serve the true and the living God, God says they don't like me. They hate me. And so when God had a family and God had a nation, he says, there's a Decalogue. Put it on your walls. Put it in your houses. Put it everywhere. But he said, I want you to know this. I want you to know this. You must not make any other gods. You must not have any images of any kind. You, I don't want anything that even r looks like a god. I don't want you bowing down to them. I don't want you making them. I want you to serve only the true and the living God. That's all that I want you to serve. Now, that was a commandment uh, from on high. What we wanted you to see in these first lessons is when God was doing what? When, when the world was saying, I refuse and I won't serve this God, then God was doing things. And it was during that time that Hinduism was born and that Buddhism was born. And we're going to te be telling you more about that and giving you more people uh, in the Bible of what they were doing. So when those things came about, God was speaking from heaven to Abraham. He would speak to anybody. God is no respecter of persons. You have to resist God for him not to speak to you. And so at the time that God had Melchizedek as a priest in Jerusalem, they were making themselves little ugly gods like this to worship. I want you to see that all... And, and, and neighbors, these have, to do, these have to do with the actual genealogy and the actual dates of things that existed and when these things came into being. And God was busy at the very time when heathen religions were born. God did not want them to be born because there is one way to heaven. 
There's one way to God, and Jesus Christ is that way. And may I urge you and ask you at this time, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, let him come into your heart. Receive him into your life. You'll be happy that you did. You'll be glad that you did. And we want you to know that Christ loves you. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to everlasting life. We want you to know him. Whom to know is life eternal. We know that you appreciate these, uh, these lectures and that you want more of them. These lectures are available on videotape, on three-quarter inch videotape. They are available in study groups, on audio tape. They are available uh, in written form so that you can, in a syllabus, in a teaching syllabus, there are three ways that you can study these truths along with us. And we want you to study them. It's now time for the world to turn back to God, to turn away from idols, to turn away from these dead things that cannot help them. So I want you to write to me, Lester Sumrall. And if you have found the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, also write and tell me about it. We will be so glad. We will rejoice with you over the power of God that sets men free. Just write me, South Bend, Indiana, zip code 46624. Would you do it today? Just sit right down and say, Brother Sumrall, thank God. We know the, the story of man from the beginning up until the heathen religions were born. And that for thousands of years, there were no pagan religions. And, and, and there were no idol worship. And that these things have come about in, in, in violation to what God wants a man to do and what God wants a man to be. Join me in prayer that God will bless the nations of the world and that God will give us revival in our time. Thank you for being with us. Uh, there are 16 of these lessons and others of them are coming up. And we hope that you will join us in each of those lessons and study what God was doing when non-Christian religions were born. Thank you for being with me.